I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we can think about designing material systems. And humans actually have been really creative about using materials in the body for many, many years. If we look back throughout history, for example, you can look right back to the Egyptians and think about how they used to use plants to regenerate uh, the body by making artificial sutures. We can also think about how the Mayans would use artificial blue shells, nacre shells, to regenerate teeth. And you can also think about using things like ivory as artificial hip implants. And many years ago, people also used sausage casing as dialysis tubing. So very inventive ways of using these materials within the body. If we look now throughout the field of regenerative medicine, people are working on virtually every tissue that you can think of. So from cardiac to bone, cartilage, neural, other kinds of applications. And for all of those different applications, we need to think very carefully about how we design the material systems, because they're going to be very different in all those application systems. So I'm first going to tell you a little bit about how people think of the field of tissue engineering and how we use materials within that. Within the field of tissue engineering, what people do is they can take a material system, they can design its chemistry, its three-dimensional structure, and they can then put stem cells into it from the patient, grow these up in a lab, and put them back in the body to repair the tissue system. So one of the things we did many years ago, uh, when I was still at MIT with Professors Langer and Shastri, is that we decided to simplify this tissue engineering approach. So rather than grow things up in the lab, we actually designed rather simple material systems, but we injected them directly in the body and we injected them in a very special place. We all have a tissue called the periosteum on the outside of our long bones, and that tissue is normally very tightly bound to the underlying bone. And what we did was to develop ways to uh, enter underneath that tissue, create an artificial space between the tissue and the underlying bone, inject our biomaterial system, and that then created a perfect environment for lots of cells to multiply and create a new bone that we could then use for transplantation. And at the time we did this, we didn't have to add any complex growth factors or anything else, and we were able to generate one of the largest amounts of bone that had been reported in the literature up to that point. Going forwards from that, we can think about using scaffolds in even different kinds of ways. So one of the things that people often do when they design a material system and a scaffold is they could print it, for example. You all will have heard of 3D printing. But they will print it so that the pores are big enough that blood vessels can grow and grow right into these material structures as the new tissue forms. And because these pores are rather big, these are called micropore scaffolds, what happens is that the cell itself, even though the material is three-dimensional, the cell actually sees it as more of a two-dimensional curved surface. And so it tends to flatten on that material and adopt a very unbiological shape. A different kind of approach where you can get away from this is to actually design a material with nanofiber dimensions, so very, very small fibers, and those will encapsulate the cells in three dimensions, give lots of information, and you'll actually see those cells changing shape. And this is a different way to think about regenerative medicine. It would be really great, actually, if my slides could come up, because then I could show you some wonderful pictures of some of these things that I'm um, talking about. Because one other material that I want to tell you about is a completely new technology that we've developed within our laboratory. And this is actually a technology that we call a nanoneedle technology. And what we make there are smart surfaces where we have very, very small needles, actually hundreds of needles uh, compared to the size of a single cell. And we can um, grow cells on those surfaces, and you'll see a cell would uh, land on the top of them. It looks like a cell landing on a forest, and those tiny individual needles will go into the cell, and you can probe the cell at this very high resolution, so hundreds of needles per cell. So, so in those kind of applications, um, what we can do, for example, is we can deliver, use these needles to deliver in vivo so we can access the muscle, for example, uh, within uh, preclinical models. And we can load the needles with small amounts of potent drugs. 
And in some of our experiments, what we've done is we've taken our bed of needles, loaded them with these potent drugs, put them on the muscle for just a few seconds, taken them off again, and being able to deliver very specifically small amounts of these drugs that then can help in the creation of lots of new blood vessels. And these sort of technologies are very new. They're not re yet ready for use in the clinic, but they're extremely exciting in terms of their potential. Another area that we can think about using them is uh, in the area of tumor detection. So one of the big problems when people are cutting out a tumor in the clinic is that as they cut out the tumor, then um, the surgeon can find it very difficult actually to see the distinction between the healthy tissue and the tumor tissue. And in those particular instances, what will happen is that they will tend to cut out a larger area of healthy tissue around the tumor because they don't want to leave any tumor in by mistake. Now with our needles technology, what we can do is actually apply the needles to that interface between the healthy tissue and the tumor tissue. And suddenly the tumor tissue itself will light up with single cell resolution. And so what this enables you to do is within the operation setting to actually see where the tumor is finishing and cut much more um, in, a, in a way that's much better for the patient so you're not cutting out so much healthy tissue. The second area I wanted to tell you about is how we can think about using material systems for biosensing, and particular what I would call ultra-sensitive biosensing. So this is being able to detect diseases earlier. And I'm talking here about a whole range of different diseases. This could be applied, for example, in cancer or cardiovascular disease, infectious diseases. We're interested in this in uh, countries across the world, so within Europe and, and US and, and so on, but also within developing nations, depending on the different application settings. And to do this kind of work, you need a very interdisciplinary approach. We have teams of medics, engineers, chemists, all sorts of different people coming together. And in fact, people from many different universities and organizations. These are very difficult challenges to, to tackle. And what we've done, ah, you'll get a very fast preview now. So there's some materials, there's some organs, some tissue engineering, the in vivo bioreactor. So this is a ge generation of bone. What you can see on the left there is all the new bone that's generated in the body, large amounts that you can transplant. Different types of scaffold. These are the needles I was telling you about. These are the blood vessels, and these are the cancer detection I just mentioned with the fluorescent tissue lighting up. So for disease detection, in this very interdisciplinary approach, what we've done is set up this interdisciplinary center called iSense. And the aim of iSense, it's many different universities coming together, is to enable us to detect very important infectious diseases, to test them at the point of care, and then potentially to treat them and really impact on human health applications. This is the overview of iSense. We also work uh, with AHRI in South Africa because we really want to get these innovations to the field. You can see there are different components coming together. Part of the project is around identifying new biomarkers. My particular bit of the project is around developing new types of nanomaterials that will give us much better signal for disease detection. And we can then develop these types of sensors in a point-of-care type assay. So a little bit like a pregnancy test, only much, much more sensitive. And the nice thing about this is we can then develop them in formats that we can read on a mobile phone. So you could do them at the point of care, read the signal out, and start to understand how disease is spreading. This is uh, an image you can see of one of the tests we've developed and uh, how we would read this on the mobile phone. And we have a number of different apps that can then quantify for us how much of the um, disease biomarker is present. And we can get to very sensitive levels of disease detection. I'm going to finish by showing you just a couple of applications of where we've shown this in the field. We were very, um, very motivated to uh, do some work where we could help with understanding how Ebola was spreading. And so we developed some tests that we took to Uganda. Uh, this is again a very collaborative project. This has just come out in publication last week. And what we did there was to develop these tests so that you could take a very uh, small sample of blood from the patients 
and you could use it to determine what strain of the virus, what strain of Ebola these patients had had. And we were able to distinguish with very high sensitivity between three different strains of the virus and read this on their mobile phone. So you could generate this map to understand how these diseases are spreading within the field. And this, this sort of application is really important, not, not in telling whether someone has Ebola or not, because uh, these are all survivors of Ebola, but actually really understanding what's happening with these diseases and how are they spreading and how can we use that information to stop future outbreaks. The final example I want to show you is slightly different. It's another point of care technology. This is a technology we're very um, excited about. It's actually been developed and is now the most sensitive, well, the point of care test that is more sensitive than any commercially available point of care test for protein in the world at the moment. And this is a test, uh, again, it's a little bit like the, the pregnancy strip scenario, but this time we use some really clever engineering innovation. We use some very small particles of inorganic material, they're called platinum nanocatalysts, and those act as artificial enzymes to amplify the biosensing signal. And when you do that, you end up being able to amplify the signal so much that you can detect tiny, tiny amounts of protein associated with HIV virus. And so you can use this sort of approach um, to, to tell you about different ranges of, of the virus, but also um, concentrations of the virus that are much smaller than what you can do at the moment with commercially available tests. And this has been tested throughout London hospitals and is now um, uh, being applied uh, in the field in South Africa with our collaborators at places like Somkele Clinic. So in this very short talk, I hope I've given you a bit of an overview of how we can think about using material systems in really creative new ways to both heal the body and also detect disease much earlier. Thank you very much. Thank you.